Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E7. Uh, my name is Dan Armendaris, and uh, this is all about exposing digital photography. And I thought uh, before we begin, I would actually have you say cheese. And uh, what I'm going to do is take a uh, photograph here that I will describe in just a second. Um, I know this is awkward. I have to walk all the way over here and all the way back, but I forgot my phone. And I'll explain why this is important in a second. But don't worry if uh, you think that you will be in the photo. You don't have to correct your hair. Oh, except uh, all the people on that side of the room. Oops. All right, hold on. And OK. And uh, you should have been here last semester when I put up this big block of cheese on the first day, and I just, I just choked. I said, why on earth did I put a big block of cheese up there? I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. But thank goodness uh, you now have a much more refined version of the lecture available to you today. OK, so what is going on here uh, with the camera over there that you can see has something oddly reflective taped on top of it, and I put a big block of cheese up there. Um, I'm basically taking what's called a pinhole photo, and this is, a, this is still a digital camera, uh, but because it is digital, we will be able to see the results much more easily than if it was just film, and I had to go home, uh, do one hour rush processing, and then come back, and all of a sudden it would be all set. But basically, uh, what this is meant to show is that this is a very basic lens on the front of the camera, even though it's somewhat hard for you to see from here. Uh, there's a photo here of what was originally the part that is on top of, or rather in front of the camera at this point right now. And all, all this is is called a body cap. And so you're probably familiar with lens caps, uh, which are you know the plastic pieces that go on the front of lenses to protect them. But SLRs, uh, or single lens reflex cameras, also have body caps, which can protect the body from any damage as well. And that is what this is. And basically, took the body cap, drilled a hole in the mill, and taped a piece of aluminum foil on it. And after much trial and error, and after a lot of toil, used a, a very fine needle to poke a hole in, in as straight and as middle of, the, uh, of this aluminum foil as was possible. And the reason that uh, I did this, rather than just using a drilled hole, is that this way I could get a much finer hole in the middle of this, uh, this body cap. And the idea here is that um, not a lot of light is being let through, as you can imagine. There's a very tiny pinhole. But still, what you will be able to see is that uh, we're still able to capture an image. And basically, what, is, uh, what this implies is that we can really use a lot of things to try to take uh, an image or to try to take a photograph. Luckily, it's, or rather, it's not that easy these days uh, to try to make a digital camera from scratch. But you can make fairly easily a pinhole camera. All you really need is a box of some kind that lets in no light, a very small hole at one end, and some film or some way of recording the light on the other end. And in fact, people have used something like Legos even to try to create a pinhole camera. And this is a, a pretty fun thing to do, uh, if, especially if you want to, um, if you want to teach, uh, well, this is separate from what I'm doing now, but if you want to just teach the uh, more basic concepts of photography, uh, this is a very fun thing to do uh, and, just, and just try it out. Uh, and you can see that there's a whole variety of steps here. And, and the reason that I'm showing you this is that um, partially cam digital cameras today are, are very, very expensive. And I know with the economy being what it is, we want to make things as cheap as possible. So here's your version one of the camera that you can use for this, uh, for this class. Um, but really, all this is meant to show is that there's a variety of, of cameras available. You can make your own even if you want to. And uh, what we are teaching throughout this course applies to just about every type of camera that there is. They're all bound by the same laws of physics. A lot of the, uh, the, the photography terms have converged such that uh, even if you are familiar with film photography terms, they're still applicable to the digital photography terms of today. So I mentioned that on, uh, and behind this pinhole lens that I'm using is an SLR. And so here's a representative photo of an SLR, albeit a much fancier one than the one that's hanging on the tripod over there. Um, but all an SLR really means is that you can take off the lenses. You can change lenses. So you can have really small lenses like this, which I actually will highly recommend this particular lens if you're new to, uh, to digital photography. And you can get much more expensive and much larger lenses like this and swap them out easily so that you will be able to get a variety of different effects, different focal lengths out of one 
body or one camera. And this is actually a, a really nice thing because now you can have an investment in, in a camera and some lenses and you can add on to that investment rather than having to purchase an entirely new camera, an entirely new system, you can just purchase a lens. Though usually when you get to this sort of grade of stuff where you're getting lenses that are this big and camera bodies that look like this, then you're talking about uh, plunking down quite a bit of money into each of these things. So usually when we see a camera like this, an SLR more generally, uh, we consider it to be a, a professional camera. And this is uh, typically, if you see someone walking around with this, you might say, oh wow, this is, uh, that's, that person knows what he's doing. He has a, a really nice camera. They're generally bigger, faster, more expensive. They have much more battery life. Uh, they're much heavier. Uh, they're usually water resistant, considerably stronger, a variety of, of these things, but also the, the, the big cons that I listed, of course, are the weight and the price. And so those are the downsides to these uh, that their little cousins don't actually have to deal with so much. So compact cameras, and, and for this course, we're going to very generally classify cameras into two types, SLRs like the one I just showed you, and compact cameras, which can include pretty much everything else besides maybe camera phones, which could arguably be in, their, in a class of their own. And compact cameras are what they sound like. They're smaller, they're more compact, they're cheaper, they're lighter, uh, but also for a variety of reasons, they have not as good battery life. Their optical quality is not that good, they have some problems, but there are many exceptions to this, so don't take this as sort of, you know, oh, oh I have to, to get the absolute best quality, I have to go buy an SLR. Many things in photography are, have and are exceptions, and this is one of them. And all of these things are give and take. You're giving some things and taking others away uh, when we are talking about camera size especially. And um, though a lot of this course, uh, because we, we really start diving into a lot of the specifics of digital photography, even going into a little bit of math, nothing that you have to worry about, trust me, it's just a little bit of math so that you can start to understand what's going on uh, behind the shutter or underneath the hood, uh, digital or compact cameras still have their use today. And in fact, they're they are very good uh, for a variety of things. And I really don't mean to discourage them. And as an example, there's uh, this website. It's, it's um, a website called ShapeHim and there was a I think it's a blog of some kind that I, I don't normally frequent, but I, I love linking to this because of the content of this one particular blog post. And basically, uh, some people had given uh, some, f uh, some folks from a village in, in Africa, I, I believe it's, uh, Lesotho is the name of the place. I forget if that's the name of the village or, or the municipality or what have you. Uh, and they gave these folks uh, not just compact cameras, but one-time use cameras, the, you know, the, five, ten dollar cameras that you go buy at CVS, you, you know, take 30, 30 shots or so and then you uh, give them back to, uh, to get your photos printed. And what they got back after they were done taking photos, because they're very simple as you know, you look through the viewfinder, you push the button when you want to capture that one particular shot, what they found was honestly really quite striking, really beautiful photos from people that maybe had not used the camera before, maybe even had not ever seen one before, but still they managed to capture what happens in their daily lives very, very well. And I think some of these photos are actually quite astonishing as, as far as photos go, just because they're interesting, they offer insights into a place that I myself have never been, uh, and it's, it's just a really wonderful thing. And so this is part of what makes photography so interesting. You can have the most expensive equipment in the world, but if you are not taking uh, photos, well, this is a touchy subject, but if you are not taking photos that are in interesting with that expensive equipment, then arguably you have wasted that equipment. And of course, you could just be taking photos for yourself or for your family. That's, uh, you know, that redefines what could be interesting in a photo. But what I'm trying to say here is that you don't have to spend a lot of money to be able to get interesting photos. That's really the whole point of this. And I'm not trying to discourage you uh, from spending money on it because as you can see, I certainly have spent my fair share of dollar signs on some of this equipment here. Um, but they are tools, a, a camera, the lens, the tripod, all of this stuff is a tool for you to accomplish a task of taking a photograph. And whether you have interesting scenes to take a photo of or not is a different story altogether and maybe one that you know, if you had a lot of money, maybe you could actually purchase interesting scenes. But okay, 
stepping away from all of that, um, all of that stuff and, and now talking more about some of the more technical details, let's take a look at the inside of a, uh, uh, an SLR camera. So here is, uh, frankly, just a, um, a Wikipedia image of what an SLR basically looks like. And so we can break this down into a couple of different parts. So you see number one here, there's a couple of uh, lens elements. This here is just the lens that you are putting in front of your SLR. And remember that you can change this, of course, so the lens characteristics could be different. You could have different numbers of glass elements here. They could look different. They could be concave, convex, any number of things, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. But then what's more interesting beyond the lens is the SLR body itself. So two through eight here. And so you'll see that there is this diagonal line that's marked as number two. And what this line is, is a mirror inside of the SLR camera. And in about 40 seconds when this photo is done, I'll actually be able to show you an example on the inside of an SLR if you haven't seen one yet. But there's actually a mirror that redirects the light that's coming in from a lens up. And upward, above that, is the viewfinder that basically bends the light and reflects around and does a bunch of things that eventually will then turn the light and shine it into your eyes so that you can see what the scene is once you are looking at uh, or once you are looking through the viewfinder. Okay, so I have to take another trip to the other side of the stage over here where I can turn off this exposure. All right. I'm going to wait a few minutes. Oh, I forgot to turn off the alarm first. I gotta say, that's a really annoying alarm and a great one to wake up to because you will get up in the morning. Anyways, okay, so the light is reflected by two up into these other parts, five, six, seven, and eight. And so five um, isn't really important to us now, but it's, uh, it's what's called a focusing screen. And uh, in many SLR cameras, you can change this focusing screen. This was more important back in the film days uh, before the advent of uh, autofocus cameras where you could put focusing screens that were maybe a little bit crisper or a little bit duller or any variety of characteristics so it, made, it would make it easier to focus on something uh, within the screen. And so usually uh, we don't worry too much about five. Uh, six is a condenser lens that just helps uh, funnel the light into seven, which is the pentaprism, which I mentioned reflects the light about and into your eye, uh, which is present beyond the, di the diopter eight your eyes probably over here somewhere. And uh, a number of cameras feature uh, an, adjustable, an adjustable eyepiece, an adjustable diopter uh, number eight there, which uh, if you wear glasses uh, like me, then you can actually adjust it so that it can be slightly, the, the image can be um, uh, adjusted to be slightly closer, slightly farther away so that you can try to compensate uh, for whichever direction your eye happens to be in unless you are actually like me and your eyes are so bad that it doesn't really matter whichever way you go, it's not going to make any difference at all, then you have to wear contacts regardless. Okay, so back to some of the more interesting bits. Uh, number three and number four. So you can see that here that we have two lines. Number four is where all the magic happens. Once number three, the shutter opens, light is collected, uh, or rather light falls on number four and is collected by it. It is the sensor or the film, depending on what type of uh, camera you have. Uh, and this is, um, this is actually going to be really important to us, the shutter and even the location of uh, the film plane itself, or the number four, uh, because it's, uh, these things affect the characteristics of the camera and, and will actually impact how your photos will look after you take a photo, in certain circumstances, at least. Okay, so here you can kind of see, if you take a step back and, and look at the overall shape, you can kind of see where the SLR gets its distinctive shape, where it has this sort of funny looking hump on the top and then it has some stuff going on in the middle here. All of this is because of just this set of circumstances that, that uh, camera manufacturers have used over time. And um, I will also mention that for the most part you will see me using and referencing Canon and Nikon cameras. And that just happens to be because 
they're right now the leaders in the, in the market. And there are, though, very viable alternatives in the market today, such as Sony. Sony's sort of come out of nowhere, especially in recent weeks, with some very powerful, very strong models uh, in their lineup that are going to give Canon and Nikon a run for their money. But still, um, there are reasons that I still don't recommend some of these uh, smaller companies and, and would rather recommend some of these larger ones um, for a variety of reasons. Sony, for example, uses a, a proprietary mount and the mount is basically the shape of the back of the lens where the lens fits on the camera itself. And so you, um, and I mean, that is true with Canon and Nikon as well, but Canon and Nikon have a very wide selection of lenses, whereas Sony doesn't yet have that wide selection of lenses. So their lenses are more expensive uh, and also fewer to choose from, which is bad for you. So you could buy a very cheap camera from Sony, but not necessarily yet have the lens choice that is available to you from Canon and Nikon. That's just one example. Okay, moving on. There's a, there's a special little icon on just about every SLR that you see, and this exists not only in, on digital cameras, but also on film cameras. And you'll notice that it is this circle with a line through it, and this indicates the location of the film plane. Um, and what this means is, if you take, if you imagine that you have uh, a plane, you just go right through where that line is, that is exactly where the sensor is inside of the body of the SLR. So to remind you, number four here, the sensor, where the light falls eventually and where it is captured by the camera, uh, is indicated by this uh, focal plane icon on the camera. And most cameras, if not all, will have this. And this can actually be very, very useful to you, especially if you are making a pinhole camera or if you are modifying uh, in some way the, uh, the, the length of the lens um, on the camera body itself. So typically you won't need to know it when you're just putting a, any random lens that fits on it onto the camera body, uh, but it is useful, especially later when we start talking about some focal length calculations and some of these other things, uh, it is useful to know where this is. Okay, I'm just sort of blowing through all of this stuff, but does anyone have any questions before I move on? Oh, good. Perfect. All right. All right, so one of the problems with an SLR that doesn't really happen with a compact camera is that um, it's not a closed system. If you remember, there's a variety of things that are moving around over here. So if you remember, this is that mirror that folds up. Uh, it, it, well, I didn't mention this, but it has to fold up and out of the way for the light to be able to pass through it and then eventually onto the sensor. Um, but because these mirrors can actually move up and out of the way and the shutter opens, there is actually a way that you can see the sensor itself on a digital SLR. And so this means that it is essentially exposed to the outside world. Even if you never actually see it, if you change lenses and are taking photos, it is still being indirectly exposed to the outside world. And so for a variety of reasons, uh, whether it be... Um, uh, some extra stuff that, uh, that accumulated because of um, assembly or because of sloppy uh, lens changing on your part, dust can get on the sensor itself. And this can be a really huge problem and really, really annoying. And um, you'll notice that uh, although it doesn't necessarily ruin a good image, it can really annoy you to no end when you notice it. So here, this is an image, it's all right, I guess. But one of the things that you'll notice is that, that there are a couple of pretty bad dust spots on it. Uh, let's see. Oh no, I used to have circles around it that would highlight you, hi show you where it is, but uh, no longer. Let's see. Uh, let me go, okay, I'll just do this. Can you see, if I go back and forth, can you see where some of the dust spots are? And it's really annoying. When I saw this and I saw this dust spot right there, I just wanted to shoot my camera because it's so, uh, it's so frustrating. Luckily, there's a couple of ways that you can combat this. But if you're going to, or if you don't already have an SLR and you're thinking of purchasing one, just keep in mind that this is some maintenance that you're going to have to do with an SLR. You're going to have to clean the sensor on it to rid it of dust. And if you don't do that, well, you're going to have to accept that it's going to accumulate and you'll have to clean it up later. So you'll notice that here, for the most part, I was able to clean off uh, all of the dust in software. It's not as visible now, uh, but it's certainly not perfect as if it were uh, there. But um, this, is, uh, this is probably one of the, the biggest problems of, of digital SLRs today because 
unlike film cameras, the sensor doesn't move. It's, it's, it doesn't go, it doesn't receive back into a film canister. You're not changing it out every single frame. Uh, so there's opportunities for the dust, for dust to fall on it. And uh, it is a little bit of a white line. Uh, dust doesn't actually fall on the sensor itself. There's a variety of filters that are on top of the sensor uh, that we'll talk about probably mid-semester. But uh, for now, you can just think of that whole unit as being the one sensor. And uh, there are ways to combat this that I mentioned. Um, uh, you can use, uh, so the old school way of doing it was actually to have basically a brush. And it looks like, it honestly looks like a paintbrush. But uh, I'm going to recommend that you don't go to Home Depot and buy any old paintbrush and assume that you can just whisk away the dust on your sensor. Uh, because that will be a very, very bad thing. Um, mostly because uh, those... Oh man, this is going to be very anticlimactic if I can't get this off. Uh, mostly because those bristles um, are not designed to stay on the, uh, the brush very well. And so they could eventually come loose and uh, having a big bristle on top of your sensor is a lot worse uh, than having just a little speck of dust. Uh, so this basically is, is um, what's called a sensor brush. And this was an overpriced um, brush, really, that uh, um, Okay, that um, you spray some air through to statically charge it. I'm not sure I ever actually believe this. But you spray some air through it to statically charge it, and it's supposed to attract dust away from the sensor as you basically brush the sensor itself um, and, uh, and clean the sensor of dust. There are now newer technologies. I believe this particular product is from a company called Visible Dust, uh, and they now have actually limited their... Um, uh, their products to not just sensor brushes, or they, they've limited their range of, of sensor brushes to be very, very minimal. And they now have some really fancy, very expensive uh, brush hybrid combinations, something or other, uh, that are actually supposed to do a better job. But actually, I've, I've never even bothered testing or, or seeing if that's true. But I will caution uh, that using liquid of any kind on your sensors, even something like alcohol or, or something like that, is probably not the best idea because you don't want that getting uh, around the sensor and into the electronics itself. Some people will say, oh, it's perfectly fine, nothing will happen, and that may be true, um, but that's not something that I'm going to test for myself. And on just about every camera, on every uh, digital SLR, there's an option that you can't read because the screen is abnormally small uh, called Sensor Clean. And when you select this, all it does, oops, I didn't select. All it does is you hear the mirror flip up, and it just exposes the sensor underneath. So now, right now, if, if one of you were to, um, uh, what are they called, the, have, throw a spit wad into my camera, I'd be a little angry at you. Um, but it, it essentially is just exposing the sensor to the world right now. And this is one of the reasons why dust is such a, a problem, and it, it certainly will be as soon as I close the shutter, um, is that it's just, it's just out there. It's just exposed. But um, remember that I mentioned that there was a mirror in front of the sensor here. And part of the reason that you hear that shutter click is that this mirror has to move up and out of the way before the sensor can actually be shown. Um, ooh, I actually have a video of this in super slow-mo, and I hope I remember to, uh, to uh, bring it. If not, um, OK, I will, I will get it. Um, all right, I'll probably have to show it to you after the break, uh, but it's this really cool, somebody actually recorded uh, uh, what happens in an SLR in super slow-mo when, um, uh, when a photo is taken and the mirror moves up and out of the way. But in the meantime, while this is downloading uh, from my other computer, uh, you will also notice that one of the things that uh, an SLR also has that I didn't really mention in that simplified overview of the SLR body is that there is a secondary mirror behind the primary. So there's this primary mirror, which is mostly responsible for sending uh, light up into the pentaprism and through the viewfinder, but it's also, it's not a complete mirror. It's also just slightly transparent, so light can also go through it while being also being reflected, so half of it or so goes through it, and then is reflected down by a secondary mirror. 
And this is what allows us to get exposure or to do autofocus. Down here, below the, the mirror box, as it's called, because there's a, you know, it's a box of mirrors, uh, there are a couple of sensors that uh, the camera uses to determine metering. So it, it uses that to determine what um, settings it should use to try to capt properly capture the exposure. And also it uses it for autofocus. So it can say, OK, uh, well, this looks like it's slightly out of focus, so I'm going to adjust the focus in this direction or that direction. Uh, and if you were to actually clean your sensor, uh, and it moves because it moves the mirrors out of the way, you can look down and try to see some of the holes where that light goes down and into the autofocus and uh, exposure or metering uh, sensors. Okay, let's see, did this transfer yet? I hope so. All right, I think I have one. All right, okay, so we have here uh, I actually have a couple of videos. So um, first I'll show you one uh, just as a representative example from my camera. And we're going to be looking at a couple of things here. But first of all, this is just a generic digital camera. You'll notice that they've removed the, uh, the lens so you can actually see the mirror. Uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. All right. Uh, and what they're going to do when I push play is they're going to hit the button and take a picture. All right, so it's going, it's going, it's going. You can see the mirror move out of the way. There's the shutter, it's closed, and you saw it open very quickly before it closed again. Okay, if you didn't see that very well, don't worry about that. Um, we'll look at a different one, but I want you to notice something uh, about this change. So take a look here at the size of the mirror relative to the size of this metal ring, which is the mount where the lens goes. Now I'm going to show you a newer camera called a 5D. Uh, notice that the mirror is much bigger. And uh, if you've ever heard, if you're interested in, in photography and you've heard of some of these arguments between full frame and, and cropped sensors, this is one of the primary differences between the two, is the size of the sensor and therefore the size of the mirror box uh, and of the pentaprism as well. So because the sensor is actually larger, in this case the, the uh, 5D and the 5D Mark II are full frame sensors, so they're actually the, the size of a full 35 millimeter film frame. Their mirror, their mirror box and sensor are also much larger. Okay, so hopefully now we should be able to see that same action in a 5D. This is the original 5D, not the Mark II, much better way. And in fact, this one has been slowed down enough that you could actually see the secondary mirror. Uh, I don't know if all of you caught that, so be sure that you watch right behind the first mirror. As this one goes up, the secondary smaller mirror also flips up with it. And then right now, for a second, the shutter will open and then it will close right away. And just for a brief moment, was the sensor exposed? Okay, and um, one of the other things, I mean, you'll also see if you, if you look around at reviews long enough, you'll see a lot of uh, numbers being thrown at you about blackout time and, and delay for the sh between the shutter and the actual photo being taken. Uh, one of the big things that camera makers try to reduce is this delay between when the mirror has been lifted and the shutter is opened. Because when that mirror is up, no light is being reflected into the viewfinder and you can't see what is happening on the other side of the glass. And this is called a viewfinder blackout. And, and most of the times, having a very low number for this is a good thing, because that means you'll be able to see the photo for as long as possible or see the scene for as long as possible uh, before being able to do it. However, the flip side of that is that only really expensive cameras, and I'm talking about cameras that are you know, the price of a small car, literally, uh, have blackout times that are really, really, truly good. Uh, most of the time, even on the, even on the 5D, which frankly looks slow, it just, it just isn't. It's not really much of a concern, and you probably wouldn't have noticed it uh, had I not mentioned it. But unfortunately, that's part of what this class does. In teaching you all of this stuff, you suddenly realize that you have to spend a lot more money that you, than you originally intended. Okay, and just to compare, and I hope you will um, indulge me one last time, I want to show you um, the same thing from a film camera but this time, show it to you from the rear, from behind the camera. And the reason that we can't do this with digital cameras, obviously, is that it's a solid back on the, on the digital camera. But in film cameras, 
we actually had to remove the back in order to place the film canister so we could actually see now, we won't actually see what happens to the mirror box, but we can see the shutter move instead as it exposes the sensor behind it. So very briefly, could you see the sort of circle of light and now you can actually see it's automatically winding to the next film frame if you're, if you're familiar with film cameras. Uh, you can actually see for a very brief second, if you just watch it, you'll notice a circle where the lens was passing the light through. And this is actually very important to us, uh, especially later on. Uh, these lenses are circular. They don't, uh, they don't throw a rectangular light or a rectangular scene onto the camera. It's our sensors and our mirror boxes, because they are rectangular, that is what makes our scene look rectangular and our picture look rectangular. Uh, and that's going to be very important to us later on. Okay, I tend to get really excited about this stuff. Please stop me if you have any questions or if I need to go over something uh, a little bit more slowly. Okay, um, but getting off that tangent and coming back to sensor dust, a lot of digital cameras nowadays are, um, have new technologies uh, to try to, sh to combat this dust problem on sensors. And usually they come in the form of some sort of fancy uh, uh, ultrasonic vibration system that says that it, it vibrates the sensor itself or the, the, the surfaces in front of it to try to shake the dust off. And um, I think I even have, uh, let's see, a photo of, or not a photo, but, oh, I do. This is just your lucky day. I'm, I'm full of videos this time. And this, unfortunately, uh, is a very heavily marketing-based um, video from Canon, uh, but it's still, they still try to show you what is going on in one of these ultrasonic dust systems. But don't, uh, oh, what is going on? But don't pay attention to the marketing speak and instead focus on the technology at hand. Uh, so if you're familiar with Max at all, I upgraded recently to Snow Leopard and it apparently has bugs that you should be aware of. Okay, let's take a look at this. Cannon. <laughs> Dust adhering to the sensor of a digital SLR camera may have entered the camera from outside during lens replacement, or it may have been generated inside the camera. When Dust adheres to the filter on the front surface of the sensor head, its shadow appears on the photo. An EOS digital SLR camera is equipped with one of three types of imaging sensor. APS-C, APS-H, or 35mm full frame size. Canon has developed a comprehensive system to eliminate the problem of sensor dust for each type of EOS sensor. The solution is the innovative EOS integrated cleaning system. First, the system prevents the generation of dust. Canon uses various mechanisms and materials to prevent the generation of dust inside the camera. Second, the system prevents the adhesion of dust. The filter incorporates anti-static properties preventing dust from adhering to the sensor unit due to static electricity. And third, the system removes dust that still adheres. To deal with dust that adheres despite these measures, Canon developed the self-cleaning sensor unit. Ultrasonic waves vibrate the filter on the front of the sensor to shake off the adhered dust. This unique Canon system requires minimal space because a special filter is not necessary, allowing the camera's compact size to be maintained. The self-cleaning sensor unit operates automatically whenever the power is turned on or off. But even when it is operating, priority shifts to shooting mode when you press the shutter button, so you never miss a photo opportunity. Okay, anyway. All right, so that's, 
generally the idea and uh, other manufacturers have a, a similar technology as well and um, I have to say that I'm sure that it doesn't work 100% of the time but it certainly will help in combating this dust issue but one of the problems is that you're just shaking the dust off the sensor and probably on the bottom to the bottom part of the mirror box and if you move around your camera it's probably just going to get back on the sensor anyway so you're probably going to have to worry about cleaning it uh, eventually anyway despite these uh, mechanisms that these cameras have. Moving on now to take a look at the rear of a camera you'll notice that here there's not a lot of optical stuff that's going on that's interesting but instead you can see that there's a lot of circuit boards and a lot of computer looking type devices that are inside of a digital camera uh, that help us produce the image that we, uh, that we can, and, and every manufacturer has their own set of, of uh, chips, basically, and algorithms that they use within it. Uh, in this case, you can see that Canon has highlighted their own proprietary chip called Digic, which is their sort of processing uh, chip that they, that they love to, uh, to market all over the place. Um, but th this technology is really what helps us process, or rather what helps the camera process, the photos and save them to your memory card, which is over here, uh, as quickly as it does. And in fact, uh, to give you an idea, uh, for those of you that are familiar with, um, with computers, uh, or, or rather some computer terms, so this is a 20D. This is a, a camera from 2004, so it is now five years old. Uh, and it can take eight megapixel photos, which may or may not sound impressive, uh, at a rate of about five frames per second. And so if you do the math, you figure out that that means that this camera can actually process about 60 megabytes per second of data. Uh, let's see, so that's about a tenth of a CD, for example, if, if you want an analogy. Um, but nowadays, and um, so right now, uh, the Canon world is sort of a flutter with uh, a, a camera that Canon is rumored to come out with, or rather to announce tomorrow. And so I don't have any special knowledge about this except what I... Uh, you know, read late at night on Canon rumor sites, but it's supposed to be this super big, super fancy camera um, that is going to be very, very fast. And uh, if we are to believe the rumored specs, it is going to be 18 megapixels at eight frames a second, which is a significant upgrade. And in fact, that rather than being, uh, you know, about 60 megabytes per second in this five-year-old camera, that is now 240 megabytes per second uh, in, a, in 2009 form. So this tells us a couple of things. So unlike film cameras, digital cameras are now advancing at a rate that is similar to computers. So if you've ever bought a computer, go back to Best Buy or the Apple Store the next day and find out that it's been upgraded or made cheaper or something like that. The same thing is happening now with camera bodies. So if you're going to buy a digital camera, I'm going to say this several times today, um, to really to hammer the point home, don't waste all your money on the camera itself. Instead, focus your money on lenses, because lenses do not depreciate in value. They do not change as frequently as the bodies do these days. So, you can, so buying lenses is more of an investment than buying camera bodies. And in fact, for the most part, I recommend buying used cameras, because this is a five-year-old camera, but it has better quality than a lot of the compact digital cameras out there today. And it's still very useful. It's still quick. Five frames per second is not slow by any measure and you can still get high quality used cameras at a reduced price. So don't waste your money buying new cameras unless you, unless you know you love digital photography and you have budgeted a certain amount of money, and I, and I mean significant amounts of money, to purchase new camera bodies as soon as they are released. I've been waiting five years for a, a, a replacement for this camera and if this rumored one comes true, it will be interesting, but I know that I love this stuff and that I've, I've saved money, squirreled money away elsewhere uh, to buy a new camera body, but otherwise using a used camera body is more than enough. Um, okay, so that's 2009. That's supposed to be a pretty good camera, and I'll certainly tell you in, in a couple of weeks if that has come true or not. Um, but uh, we should take a look back at where digital cameras actually came from. So five years ago, it sounds not as impressive as some of the stuff that's coming out today in 2009, but what about back, how about um, almost uh, 35 years ago, in 1975, when the first digital camera was born uh, by Eastman Kodak engineer Steven Sasson. So again, this was back in, in 1975, and it looks like this, um, which is a little bit bigger than what we are used to today, even uh, by SLR standards. It weighed nine pounds, 
It was black and white, and it was 0 0.01 megapixels. So it took an image that was 100 pixels wide by 100 pixels tall. And that's, that's tiny. That's very small compared to even camera phones today, which have several megapixels in size. So the iPhone, for example, has like a three megapixel camera or something like that, which is orders of magnitude larger. Oh, and also one final thing, it took 23 seconds to take a photo uh, with this, this original camera. So we've obviously come a long way. And, and again, this is really to hammer the point home that digital cameras these days are more like computers than they were uh, like uh, film cameras of the old days. So don't um, waste all your money on that stuff. Okay, so moving on, back in 1983, Canon started uh, looking at some interesting designs for digital cameras, thinking, oh, you know, this is, this is going to revolutionize photography. It's really going to change the way we look and use cameras. I don't know if that's what they actually said, but I could imagine some marketers saying that. Uh, and they hired some designer, Luigi Colani, to design some, uh, some SLRs. And this is what he came up with. So some very oceanic, very fishy, literally, uh, designs for these cameras. And, and they're pretty cool, but I would not want to be walking around taking photos with something like that looks like that. That is really, really horrible. And so eventually they started realizing that it was sort of silly and that really uh, the design that they've been using literally for years, if you notice that film camera, it's very, very similar in design to even the modern ones. Now they're a little bit you know, uh, more rounded and smoother, but for the most part, the, the general design hasn't really changed. That's a pretty good thing, and they're sticking with that. Okay, so this is some fun stuff, but this is a digital photography class. And so for us to really get into some of the nitty and gritty, we do have to talk about a little bit of math stuff. And being a computer science class, that means that we're going to reference bits and bytes. And so we are actually going to be using some of this stuff, maybe not today, maybe not two weeks from now, because we don't have class next week. But in a few weeks, we are really going to be talking about bits, bytes, a lot of these other things. So um, if you've taken some other computer science classes, hopefully this stuff looks familiar to you. A bit is the most basic uh, unit on a computer. It's either a zero or a one, off or on, you can think of it. And so a byte is just eight bits. So it's basically it's eight zeros, eight ones, or any combination of eight bits that exist there. And so if we think for a second, so a bit represents two different values, right? So it's either a zero or a one, it's two different values. So if we have a byte, which is eight bits, that means we have a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, so on and so forth, eight times. That means that we have eight slots for two units. So if you do you know, two to the eighth power, you can figure out that that means that one byte can represent 256 distinct values. So from zero all the way to 255. Um, and um, don't worry if that isn't review. It's, it's, it's useful to know that and more than just for this class. It, if you use a computer, which I'm sure you do, knowing this stuff is actually, uh, this pretty, is pretty useful. And you can actually convert from binary values to decimals. So if we wanted to write eight ones and call that a binary number and convert it to decimal, we could. Um, but I'll spare you that math. That's not something that we need to do today. Um, but before we have, or, or so not before we have bits or bytes, but before the word bit or byte, we usually have prefixes that denote some additional value. So we have some of the most common ones are kilo, mega, and giga. And so you'll notice that a kilobyte, for example, is 1,024 bytes. And uh, the reason that it is not 1,000, that it is not just an even number, is because it is meant to be a power of 2. And it just so happens that 2 to the power of 10 equals 1,024. So it's, it's all, it all works out sort of nice, and so just so long as you just have to remember that. So once you remember that part, then the megabytes is easy because it's just 1,024 kilobytes. So to figure out how many bytes that is, you have to do 1,024 times 1,024, and you get 1,048,576 bytes. You don't have to memorize the, how many bytes it is, but it's useful to remember the prefixes and to know that kilo is approximately a thousand bytes, that mega is approximately a million bytes, that giga is approximately a billion bytes. And this is the same sort of measurements that go into your computer hard drive, into even the memory card that we use for our digital cameras. It is, we are talking about this same sort of thing. And so we actually use these 
fundamental values to represent digital photos. So this digital photo from earlier is made up of millions of little tiny pixels. As you can see, there's little square dots here that themselves in computer memory are represented by a series of ones and zeros. And in fact, uh, we usually consider color to be separated into three constituent parts on a computer, a red part, a green part, and a blue part. So for every pixel that you see, and in this blown up version you can see there's one pixel here, one pixel there, so on and so forth, each one of these pixels has three constituent parts, the red, the green, and the blue. And each of those is made up by eight bits. So the red portion of that, of that one pixel is given eight bits of information. The green portion of that pixel is made up by eight bits of information. The blue portion, eight bits of information. And so you may say, well, you know, I don't really see any green in any of these pixels here. That's just because that part is given a value of zero, for example, if there's actually no green in there. So uh, as we can think of each of these, and we'll talk in more detail about this, especially in the color lecture, um, but we can think of these as, as having values from zero, where there's the complete absence of that color, all the way to 255, where is the com that is the complete presence of this color. So you can imagine that various combinations of these actually give us the colors that we see on the computer. And uh, this makes up a very popular format that you'll probably recognize uh, called the JPEG format. And so each one of these pixels is made up with eight bits of information. And so you can then imagine uh, if, if you're using a computer, actually, especially a Windows computer, and it's asking you the, the color depth, you know, how many colors you want to display on the screen. Sometimes it says something like 8-bit color or 16-bit color or 24-bit color. Uh, when they say 24-bit color, they mean this. They're adding 8-bit plus 8-bit plus 8-bit plus 8-bit. So every pixel has 24 bits of color information, basically, if that makes sense. But you know, it's not really important to us as digital photographers. This is more important, but I'm just trying to uh, uh, bring that idea back to something that may make, uh, uh, or that you may have recognized from home. So there's additional file types as well. There's also 16-bit file types. And um, for the most part, we won't really, you won't really be working with 16-bit uh, files, but it is very useful to know because most cameras are capable of producing more than just 8-bit color. This camera, for example, being five years old, is capable of 12-bit color. New cameras can do 14-bit color. And that, that may not sound like very much. That says, you may say, oh, that's just one bit. Who cares? It's just one bit of information. But remember that one bit is either a one or a zero. So every time you add an additional bit, you are doubling the number of values that exist. So if you remember, I mentioned that eight bits of information are 256 discrete values. But if you also remember, I said that 10 bits is 1,024. So just by adding two additional bits, we've gotten a lot more bits of information. So the jump from eight bit to 16 bit is a lot bigger than it actually sounds at first glance. Um, this is actually, rather than 256 discrete values, this is 65,536 per color channel. So there's a lot more values, uh, a lot more very subtle differences in the color for us to work with. And this is useful for us as photographers when we want to get the absolute most, the, the best amount of quality that we can possibly get out of a photograph, we will try to use these higher bit rates, 16 bit uh, and 8 bit. And um, when we're representing these photos in a file, uh, recognize that, that we are just saying that it's basically a, a table or a matrix or however you want to think of it, of rows and columns of these pixels, each of which has 24 bits worth of information. And if you do the math, that is a huge file. It's very, very big, and so we have to figure out some way of compressing this information, of making it smaller so that our computers, our cameras, uh, and our, even our email clients can work with this, this information and be able to send it and, and manipulate it uh, in a much more uh, easy way. And so there are uh, various methods of compression. Um, and one of the simplest ways is if we have something like these two flags. So, and, and let's assume for a moment that we'll, how we're going to compress this is we will take, we will look at each row 
individually in this. So we look at the very top row of this flag. Notice that it's the first color at the left side is black. And then we compare all the subsequent pixels after that first color. And if they're the same, then we just compress it. We say that that pixel is the same as the first one. So we say, OK, this first pixel is this first pixel in the very top of this flag is black. And so are all the subsequent ones on this row. So we can just say that in a file. And it's much smaller. It's much more compressed and much easier to say uh, in, and for a computer to understand uh, than if we were to uniquely say, OK, this one is black, this one is black, this one is black, so on and so forth. Now, if we were to take a look at the French flag, this makes it a little bit more difficult. Because as soon as we get about a third of the way through, we change colors. But still, we can still compress it quite a bit. Maybe not as much as this one, where we can go an entire row without having to change colors. But here, we can go a third of the way without having to change colors, and then another third of the way without having to change colors, so on and so forth. We can compress the size of this file by a considerable amount. But there's a slight problem with using this compression technique in photographs. And what might that be? Yes? That's right. Yeah, very few photographs have such uniform color. Even in this photograph, you'd be hard pressed to find two photographs in a row that match each other. So it's not going to work so well unless you have sections of color that are very, very uniform. So in this case, there's a photo of an apple. The background is perfectly blue, and we're able to compress that out. But the apple itself, because there's small changes in the gradient in the, from black to red and to orange and so on and so forth, we can't actually compress this very well. And so if you're familiar with the GIF format, uh, which you probably are if you remember Dancing Hamsters from back in the day, those were all animated GIFs. Um, this is what the GIF format uses. And this is just one reason why the GIF format is not very well suited to us as photographers. And so instead, what we usually see are JPEGs, which compress things slightly differently. And so without getting into a lot of the technical details, they basically breaks apart the photo into a lot of different blocks. And then it looks at each block, and it tries to figure out how it can simplify that mathematically. And so you'll notice that here on the left side, it's uh, both of these uh, are extreme zoom-ins from the, the face of this, this guy up here. And you can see individual pixels on the left side. But after some extreme JPEG compression, what you'll notice is that there's these sort of ugly big blocks that, are, that look uniform within themselves, but are not uniform with adjacent blocks. And this is part of the problem with overcompressing your images. Um, you, uh, by using JPEG, you're actually using something called lossy compression. And what this means is that it is actually throwing away some data that it thinks is not important. So um, the degree to which is defined by the, that sort of quality slider, if you've ever saved a JPEG and it goes from like 0 to 100 or something like that, the lower that value, the more bits it's going to throw out, and the more likely it's going to look like this. So you can actually save a JPEG that's very, very high quality, uh, that won't have a lot of artifacts like this. But as a result, it will be slightly bigger. But because it is a lossy compression format, the more you compress it, the worse it's going to look. And in fact, I'm going to recommend that if you have a camera that takes JPEG photos, uh, once you download those photos onto your computer, I recommend you save those originals somewhere. Because no, at no other point in time in your editing of those photos or in your manipulation of them or whatever, will they be as high quality or have as many bits as they do right then. As soon as you open that file in Photoshop or iPhoto or, or any number of things, perform a change and save it, it's redoing this lossy compression. And every time you save a file that is lossy compressed, you lose a little bit more data, a little bit more data. So you want to be sure that you keep those original files so that you can go back to them if you need to and, and have the original highest quality format or have the highest quality file that you possibly can out of your camera. Yes? Does that apply even if you do sort of save as and name it in a, as a new file? Do you still lose? 
Yes and no. So if you do a save as, using, doing just the save is extremely dangerous because now you have absolutely lost that original data. You've saved over that original file and it's a com lossy compression format so you're going to lose a few bits. But if you do a save as, then the original file that it was open from is, is still unmodified. The save as file might have a little bit less uh, uh, a little bit less quality. You may not notice it, but because it is a lossy compression, if you do it enough times, if you sit, do a save as and then open that save as and then save as again and just keep looping over and over and over again, eventually you will see this sort of thing happen. Um, oh, that reminds me, there's this really cool internet video where this guy did that with a, a photo of the sky basically and he just kept doing a save and a save and a save in JPEG and, uh, and it was basically like a time-lapse video of the original quality of this photo until it progressed to be you know this horrible mess and it was just a lot of fun to see it really didn't take well relatively that many saves it was something like 400 or something like that but still it's enough that it's I know it's silly but still it's it, it was enough that you could you could tell the, the change and, and it was it was uh, quite drastic yes No, it does not happen. Uh, no, it does not happen all the time. Only if you resave the file as a JPEG. If you copy the file straight, so like right now, I have uh, some photos on this on this memory card, for example. Let's say I download them onto my computer. It's not resaving the file, so no compression is being is taking place. It's just copying the bits exactly as they were on this memory card onto my computer. Uh, so in that case, you can uh, you can just copy the the, the files without really worrying about it at all. It's really only when you resave the file that you have to worry about it, if that makes sense. So when you say resave, it means when you change the format, save it as a format? Yeah, even, even if you don't change the format. If you have a JPEG file and you go to File, Save As, or File, Save, for example, then it's going to resave those bits. It's going to recompress. So when it opens this photo, uh, it, it has to decompress it to show you on your to show it to you on your screen. But when you save it again, and then it, it recompresses the file and saves it on your computer, that's when you get into trouble. Uh, I think I saw a question over here. So, so is that an argument then for shooting everything in RAW and just yes. using that as your starting? Yes, that is an argument for shooting everything in RAW because RAW file formats are losslessly compressed; they do not deteriorate. You have the original file, um, but there's a variety of problems with that as well that we will, of course, touch upon in the class. Yes. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Okay, great. Um, let us take a quick five minute break before we keep talking more file formats. Okay, welcome back everybody. So before we were talking about compression artifacts and I just want to quickly go over some of the popular image file types that you might come across as a digital photographer and, and uh, demystify them a little bit so that you will know what to use. Now JPEG, uh, that's the one that we are most familiar with. It has a lossy compression. It's 24-bit color, which remember means every pixel has three colors and each color has eight bits worth of information. Generally for photographs, this is the one that you are going to almost always use. Uh, alpha just means that it has uh, the ability to do transparency, which you'll notice we can't have in JPEG, which is okay, but most of these other formats we can. So GIF I talked about before with that uh, run length encoding where we, were, we saw the flags and we were able to compress those flags down to a very small size. Uh, that is a lossless compression, but the problem with that is that the color is only 8-bit. So though, um, and there's a little bit of a trick here, uh, though the, the color you can actually choose from 24 bits worth of color, it's actually, you can imagine like a painter's palette. You can only pick eight bits or 256 different colors from those and uh, be able to um, represent a photograph with it. So even so, uh, if you remember before, uh, using that lossless compression technique with the run length encoding, if that wasn't bad enough for photographs, that really, uh, that's really a nail in the coffin. That, that produces some, some pretty bad images for us. So avoid GIF. Ping is also losslessly compressed. Uh, it's also 24-bit, just like uh, JPEG. It does support alpha, so this sounds really great, um, but it's just not as widely supported as JPEG. So, uh, and also because it is lossless, 
it's the, the files aren't as small as the lossy compressed JPEG. So everything is give and take here. So PSD, that's a Photoshop <laughs> type file. Uh, I don't actually know what type of uh, compression they use. If any of you happen to be on the Photoshop team, please tell me. Uh, and it can actually support 48-bit color, which as you remember means it has the three channels and each one, uh, the, uh, and when I, when I say channel, I mean it has the three colors, red, green, and blue. Each one is 16 bits. Uh, and it, it can also support transparency within layers, and we'll talk about Photoshop in the future. TIFF, um, if we are talking about needing the absolute highest quality from uh, after you've processed a, a, a RAW file out of your camera, for example, uh, then you will probably save in TIFF because it is losslessly compressed. It is 48-bit. That means you get as much possible color out of it as you possibly can, and it is, it is also fairly widely accepted. Um, so, and, and as an extension to GIF above, it also has the animated GIF. So if you ever see dancing hamsters, that's the one. Okay, so uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this class as well. I didn't want to go through this entire class just throwing information at you. So uh, this class has 14 lectures. This is the first one. Uh, there are a few holidays interspersed throughout the semester. Be sure to take a look at the syllabus online for more information. The first one is next week. Uh, so unfortunately, I won't get to see any of you next week. Uh, and don't come because I will undoubtedly be sleeping. Um, and so then after today, we start software tools and light uh, two weeks from now, so on and so forth. And you can see that we have a variety of topics, including exposure. We, go, we, we do a lot of exposure because that's really important. Optics, where we talk about lenses and, uh, and do some fun little math there. The histogram, which uh, prob you may wonder, well, what on earth can we talk about an entire lecture on the histogram? Just you wait. I will surprise you <laughs> with all of the information that we can learn. Software tools continued. As you can tell, this is a computer science class. We will be talking quite a bit about software tools, most specifically Photoshop. Assignment slideshow. So uh, in the assignments that are given to you, and the first one was given out today, um, we will, you'll actually be submitting some photos, and I think it will be, uh, and in the past, uh, we've, students have really enjoyed looking at everybody else's photos to not only, uh, not to poke fun at them, of course, but just to take a look and see uh, what interesting photos people have taken. And this actually is, has been a, a great hit in the past, and I hope to continue that this time. Uh, digital cameras. And here, this is somewhat of a misnomer. We're talking about some of the technology specific to digital cameras, like digital sensors, some of the really funky stuff that differentiates digital cameras from their film counterparts. We have two lectures on that, then color. So uh, color is very important, and it's very difficult to be able to reproduce color accurately through the entire chain. So from the camera to your computer to print to web, for example, this is a big thing. Uh, and if, if the semester were longer, we would probably do more lectures on color, but uh, there's only so much of that I can take, frankly. Then artifacts, uh, so all of the problems that can happen because of uh, digital photography. And we've, we've started talking about some of them, like dust, and we'll be continue to talk about them throughout the semester, but uh, we will really be sure to uh, show you uh, an exhaustive, or nearly exhaustive, list of artifacts in that lecture. Finally, even more software tools, where we, we do some final, really fun Photoshop stuff, and then the final assignment slideshow the second. So in addition to the lectures, there are four assignments. You should consider them to be projects. They are three weeks long, except for the first one, which is four weeks long, because there's that, that, uh, that annoying little Monday that we're missing next week. Um, so be sure that you read them and start them early. Trust me, you will be, you'll have your hands tied with these, even though they look somewhat short at only five pages. But the class is, is very doable, so don't worry uh, about that as long as you stay on top of it. There's also uh, one final project uh, where we don't really have anything to talk about that yet, but we will in just uh, probably in a month or two, and there's zero exams. So just like um, the, I have to say, the first semester I had, I had exams, and, and then I realized, well, what's the point? You're not going to have pen and paper when you're out taking photographs and have to figure out, do I really need to be doing this and write down something like that? So none of that. You're, this, is all, this is much more practical than that. And finally, we will conclude the semester uh, with the computer science fair that we share with computer science E75 building dynamic web pages, which unfortunately uh, happens at the same time as us somewhere else in this building. Um, but we will have a sort of a joint fair with them where we can, you can show off your work 
and last year all the E7 stuff was much better than the E75 stuff. So <laughs> I, hope, I hope none of you are in E75, but I'm just telling you right now you have high expect, we have high expectations for you. Okay, the course website, cse7.org. This is where it all happens. You can find all of your resources here. Uh, though there's, there's no required textbooks, we do have a, a few that you, you might, uh, we recommend if you want to pick up some textbooks, uh, but a lot of resources are available here. Also, you'll notice that as we are videotaping this lecture, we will try to videotape most lectures, not all of them. Uh, for example, the, the assignment slideshows, I think that's gonna be really boring, just picture after picture on video, so we're not gonna do that. So be sure that you are present uh, for lecture 14 and lecture eight, but pretty much the rest we're going to try to videotape and put on the course website a few days after the lecture takes place. Uh, it's not meant as a, uh, a replacement for a lecture because uh, sometimes it can get a little close to when the assignments are due, and that's not done intentionally. It's just because we have to take the time to do the, the videos properly. Um, uh, but it is just something, it's an extra tool for you uh, to be able to get used to the material. And I talk fast, so if you need to review something, not only can you ask questions, of course, but you can rewatch a lecture, or if you happen to be out of town, you can watch it there as well. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email the staff, staff at csc7.org. Um, so I'm on that list. Uh, Chris Thayer is uh, behind the, uh, the video camera. She's also on that list. She's one of our TFs. And John Seelig, way in the back over there, uh, who likes to stay as far away from me as possible, <laughs> uh, is also there. And, uh, and uh, that's us. That is the staff. And uh, there's a lot of you. So please try not to email us individually. We will, we will get to your question. Um, but because there's three of us looking at this versus one of us looking at our individual email addresses, we will be able to answer your question uh, the quickest this way. Uh, comments, concerns, questions, doesn't matter. We, you can uh, feel free to email us there. Now this semester, we are trying a little bit of an experiment. We are going to be doing a lot of the submission for problem sets and especially photos on Flickr, which is a social website that you may or may not be familiar with. And we have established a group there uh, that you can, that you must join to submit, uh, uh, to submit photos. Uh, and as part of that group, there is a discussion board. So if you have a question that's perhaps a bit, uh, uh, doesn't need the privacy of email, for example, you might want to ask it on that discussion board. We will also be monitoring that discussion board as well. And you will also be able to get input from your peers. And this means that yes, you can post uh, you know, photos that you're proud of, for example, show it off on the discussion board, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure hopefully everybody will um, be able to participate and take a look at what's going on there. Yes? Is there a question? No. Yes? Okay. No, not necessarily. So, photos that are posted to Flickr are not necessarily public domain. So, they have uh, when you sign up for Flickr, or more specifically, when you upload photos, you can define the copyright level of them. Um, you can define, uh, you know, full copyright, all rights reserved on the photos there. Um, there are a couple of, of caveats to that. One being is that it's on the internet. Um, but you can set uh, the photos to be private, which means that they will not show up on your, on your Flickr profile. Um, but when you add them to the Flickr group, when you submit and, and read through the, uh, the assignment one for more details on this, uh, they will show up to us. So there is a way that if you really don't want them to be visible to the outside world, you can set them private and still add it to the group. And only people that have access to the group will be able to, to view those photos. Um, but in general, and we will be talking about um, this sort of copyright stuff much later in the course, in general, I'm an advocate of, of having slightly more loose um, copyright terms, especially if you post them on the internet, because it's someone is going to, if they like your photo, they're going to use it. Nothing is going to stop them on the internet from using it. And uh, so rather than trying to deal with um, uh, fighting for full copyright, because if you really want that photo to be absolutely yours and not disseminated at all, you wouldn't post it on the internet. Uh, we use, for example, even on the, on the website, uh, and for my own photos, um, we use what's called Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is slightly more lax than, uh, uh, than uh, full-blown copyright, but you can actually select the terms that you would like. And so in this case, uh, we say that you are free to 
take some of these photos and to, here, let me make it a little bit bigger. You can uh, copy and distribute and transmit the work at will. You may even adapt the work so you can, you know, you can take the photo and, and put a funny face on it or something, as long as it follows these conditions. So you provide attribution. So you say that it is from, from me or from the course, that you do not use it for commercial purposes, and that you apply these same conditions downstream so that people that uh, your derivative work or wherever you have posted it, you, those people that view it there can also perform these same steps. And this seems like uh, more to the spirit, to me at least, uh, of the internet and also is a little bit more lax. You don't have to spend all of your time dealing with um, copyright issues. Um, yes? So um, on Flickr, there is a way to, there is, they have built in the option to do Creative Commons. And you, you notice that here, uh, this is some set of restrictions applied. You can actually, via Creative Commons, change the restrictions that are applied. So you can actually say, you know what, yeah, you can use this photo for commercial purposes. You, there's actually like a tool on Creative Commons website that you can use to help you pick the right one for you. Uh, and you enter in, there's like a code basically that I believe you can enter into Flickr and they will be able to apply that directly onto your uh, Flickr photos. Um, but on the website, we just use something uh, because frankly, this hasn't yet been tested in court very thoroughly. I'm just using something very simple like uh, my name, some rights reserved, Creative Commons, BYNCSA, which is the sort of code for that. Um, uh, you know, you, you provide attribution, uh, you share a like, and it's non-commercial. But that's a whole bag of worms that uh, since I am not a lawyer, I frankly can't really get into. Okay, moving on. So yes, uh, join, the, uh, join Flickr and uh, join the discussion board and participate in all this stuff. This is going to be a fun semester for us, I think. So if you don't have a camera, don't worry too much about it. We do have some cameras available for loan, and these are the Panasonic Lumix cameras, DMCVs FZ8. It's a handful of letters and numbers, um, but these are, though they are a couple years old, they are pretty decent cameras. They're pretty good. You'll be able to complete all of the assignments with them, and you can rent them from the Church Street Lab. So 53 Church Street, uh, if, if you just go out these gates right here and cross the street, it's right there. That's Church Street. Just find the Church Street Lab, and you'll be able to rent them uh, from there. Uh, these have uh, the capability for raw photos, which if you're going to bring your own camera, it must have a few capabilities. It must be able to take photos in the manual mode, so that means you must be able to, ex to set all of the exposure settings. And also, you must be able to take photos in the raw format. So if you have one or the other option, you can probably use the camera for a little while, but just note that we quickly ramp up, and you will have to be using uh, both of those uh, pretty quickly. Even in the first assignment, I think you'll have to be using the manual mode. So uh, if your camera is not up to the task, not to worry. You don't have to buy a $3,000 camera and set of lenses. You can rent this from the Church Street Lab. I believe we have eight available. And even though I fought them every single year, they still refuse to let students borrow them for more than 24 hours at a time. So do note that restriction, that you only have 24 hours with them uh, before they do something bad to you. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, so if, if you do have your own, if you have questions about it, you are, of course, more than welcome and, more, and, and to bring it to class, ask us questions about it. Um, but generally, we're not going to be standing up and taking pictures of each other, just so that, so that you know. So you don't have to bring your own camera from home. So uh, generally, uh, if, if you're familiar, and this is, I've noticed this is decreasing over a couple of years, um, but if, you have, if you're familiar with film cameras and you're new to the world of digital photography, you'll notice that there's a lot of similarity to film, particularly in, in how, uh, especially a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, there's a lot of similarity there. A lot of the terms are similar, um, but there are some differences, particularly when we get to talking about Photoshop, when we talk about some of the specifics of digital cameras and the way that digital cameras respond in certain lighting conditions, it's very different than film cameras. So you will not have a difficult transition, but you should still pay attention if you are familiar with film. Um, so sensor sizes, for example, that's, going, that's probably going to be, well, it's not too new, but it is somewhat new uh, as far as SLR users go. Uh, ISO, all of these sorts of things are all very applicable from film over to digital cameras. Okay, so 
I want to take this lecture in a slightly different direction because you'll notice from the, the lecture um, uh, descriptions of a little while back that there's a lot of technical stuff going on. We're talking about digital cameras, exposure, optics, all of this sort of stuff, histograms. And this class uh, is, it, though we do reference the artistic side of photography, this is not an artsy class, so to speak. We, we focus on uh, primarily on the technical details. And the idea is that by understanding these technical details, by understanding what all of this stuff means, you're then more free to express yourself creatively. But this doesn't mean that we ignore the artistic side or that we think that the artistic side is unimportant because obviously it's extremely important in, uh, in a photography class. Um, but what we're saying is that we just think that for, for, to get the full the full experience, you might have to go um, to, uh, in addition to this class, another class as well. But part of this, uh, this question, or part of artistic, the artistic side of photography, I think, is the question of what makes a photo interesting. And uh, there's no right or wrong answer to this, obviously, and it, and it depends on your definition of interesting, what you like to see and what you don't like to see. But generally, I think, what can make a photo interesting is something that nobody has seen before, something that is new or exciting or maybe not uh, totally new to a person, but at least pretty rare to see. You don't see a lot of these types of photos and that sort of photo is interesting in terms of the wider audience, in terms of the general appeal. And um, it certainly is easy once you start getting really good with the technical aspect of photography to realize that you just have nothing interesting to take photos of and to fall into this sort of rut. And uh, this certainly happened with, to me uh, just a few years ago where I just felt like I had nothing that I could take a photo of. I had, I had uh, a camera. I didn't have you know, a lot of the equipment that you see here, but I had a camera and I knew how to use it. But I just feel like I had overdone. I, I mean, there's only so many photos of Harvard you can take before everybody has seen everything. And so what else is there to take? And so um, I guess, I still can't answer that, but I've, I, but at least you know I, I feel like I have it back now, and and this is something new even in just the the past few months where I feel a lot more excited about this again. And so if you do do feel like you've fallen into this sort of photographic rut, uh, don't worry too much about it. Most likely you will you will get it back. Just don't forget how to take photos. But um, I think uh, it, what can make a photo interesting is. Um, also what you like to do, what your hobbies are, what types of things you find particularly interesting. Water sports, in this case white water rafting for example, I really love doing this. I don't do it as much as I would like, but this is one of those things that you, can, you can't take a bad photo when you're doing white water, well, unless it's all water, then I guess that's a bad photo. <laughs> But you know what I mean, it's, it's in general bad. And if you are into water sports, I can talk quite a bit about this. Uh, you should probably get a case like this. This is called a Pelican case. It is a pretty hardcore case and I think it's warranted. They say it's warranted against everything except shark bite, bear attack, and children under five. You can use it as a soapbox. I stand on it, I sit on it all the time. Um, I have, I use this on this rafting trip, for example, it toss it into the river, it just floats downstream as long as you can get it again. Um, it will, your camera equipment will be safe and it's, uh, it's made very, very well. And this was actually my primary case for many, many years. But the problem is that even empty, it's just a little bit heavier than what you would like in a camera case. And so, and also it's rigid. So there's, you know, you are limited by the volume that is inside of here. And so this doesn't look very big. As you can tell, it's not going to fit this lens very well. It's not even going to fit this lens very well. But some basic kits, some basic photographic equipment you can put into a case like this. And of course, they do have various sizes available to you. Um, did I mention it was Pelican? I forgot. OK, that would be important. It's just to show you this blank, generic, gray case and say, buy this, because this is great. Um, of course, it's, 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 so it's useful if you are going to be going through extreme conditions. So sea kayaking, for example, or whitewater rafting, or pretty much anything uh, where you're going to be abusing your camera, uh, this is going to be a great case for you. And if you are going to be doing water sports, get a few of these uh, NRS webbings. Uh, these are, you can get them, I don't know, just look, I think it's uh, National River Supply or something like that. Um, but this, in combination uh, with these cases, you can attach your camera, or, or rather, you can attach the case to pretty much anything 
and not worry about it. So I strapped this camera to this, the rafts just exposed to the water and yes, we did flip and everything was perfectly fine. Nothing got wet, everything was perfectly dry. And I really don't care because these are really strong uh, grips. They're not going to uh, let go. And so uh, that's just, um, it's not necessarily an endorsement for this stuff, but just what I've found has worked very well in this sort of thing. Um, and another thing is that if you buy a decent quality digital camera, they're generally going to be made pretty well. They're going to be made out of plastic, and I, and I hit the, the door so it sounds flimsy, but, you, but they're generally going to be made of plastic on the outside but have some sort of metal uh, or magnesium frame on the inside. So they're going to be rigid and they're going to be built well. I've dropped this thing in negative, uh, I don't know, negative 10 degree weather onto some rocks and there's a little chip somewhere right here but it still works absolutely fine. And so most of this stuff, I mean, you shouldn't abuse it. Don't throw it into the river, of course. Um, but you don't have to really worry about some of this, this better stuff getting a little bit wet. You really don't have to worry about you know, dropping it accidentally. A lot of this stuff, um, well, you should worry about dropping it accidentally if you go you know, from up here. But uh, it, will, it will probably outlast your interest in the camera itself. These are, these are very well-made cameras. Uh, especially the mid-range ones, which I will talk about in just a little bit. Um, so don't over-baby your camera unless it's you know, super compact, something like that. With decent equipment, you don't have to over-baby. It is meant as a tool. It is meant to take a good photograph. But of course, take what I am saying uh, within reason and don't, and don't do anything silly or, or stupid with your equipment. Okay, going back to what makes a photo interesting, uh, if you take tons and tons of photos and I recommend that when you find something interesting you take as many photos of it as you possibly can. Part of what can make an interesting photo is that you either have really impeccable timing or you get lucky or both. And so the more photos you take the higher chance you have of getting a good one. So take lots and lots and lots and for these assignments I'm serious when I say that you should probably take hundreds if not thousands of photos for these assignments and hand pick the ones that are the best. Because here I can tell you that I probably took a whole bunch of photos and none of them were that interesting except this one. This one just happened to be, I think, the best. The best overall combination of everything and I think for it made, in the end, a reasonably successful photo. So, keepers. So you do need to make sure that um, you take a lot of photos and out of that you will have a subset of them that are good to keep and we call those in, in uh, the photographic uh, world keepers. And in fact, um, you guys know what chimping is? Ever heard of this? Okay. So, and I, I know all of you have done this. If you've touched a digital camera, you take a photo and you look at it and you go, ooh, 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 like that. That is chimping, okay? So, <laughs> don't go overboard with the chimping, please, especially in public. I laugh every time I see it. And in fact, I think one of the things that I recommend doing is that you turn off the screen, especially on an SLR. Uh, they, they usually will show you the photo that you just took for a second or two after you took it. Turn that off. Don't waste the battery. Just keep taking photos and then review the photos later because I guarantee that how the photo looks on your camera is not going to look the same as when you bring it on your computer screen. It's going to, when it's on the bigger screen, you're going to say, oh, that looks a lot worse than I thought it did on the camera. So keep shooting. Uh, well, you should review. The screen is very useful. You should review it. But I'm just saying as a general rule, uh, don't chimp too much. Um, and uh, I think if you, if you have not seen it also, I feel like I'm going over everything that I'm going to be talking about this semester. I'm not going to have anything else to talk about, but don't <laughs> worry. I always find something. Um, but if you want to see interesting photos, uh, go to boston.com's The Big Picture. Just Google for it and find it. Uh, I don't have the best internet connection in here. But every week or every couple of days, they have really large really excellent pictures about some topic and they're always extremely moving I think a lot of the photos so um, uh, as, as you know Senator Ted Kennedy recently passed away and so they did uh, a big picture about him and so they're right now in this case there's only one um, but they have other oh boy I don't know if I can find it now but they do have other um, big pictures that are uh, you know equally or even more perhaps uh, incredible than this. So let's see. Oh, yes. Yeah. So this one here, for example, ballots, bullets, and bombs in Afghanistan. They run uh, uh, 
a series of photos from Afghanistan, you'll notice that there's, uh, it says there's 43 photos here. And all of them are, are really interesting. And in fact, um, there's one photo that's extremely moving of, of, um, of a, an AP photographer that uh, was nearby when a, a car bomb blast went off. And he uh, unfortunately lost his foot, but on a gurney, he was still taking photos. And there's a photo of him on a gurney still taking photos, and it's, it's incredible. It's just an incredible picture. And, and I really recommend this website, um, not only to see interesting photos, but to look at the style and see how people are taking these photos. And, and this stuff, no matter how good of a photographer you get, um, you should never become so cocky as to look at a photo that, that's something like this and say that it's imperfect or that it's, it's bad. Because there may be imperfections, but it still, it conveys something. And that is what these photos are meant to do, I think. So uh, without, um, you know, I mean, we could spend lectures talking about the photos at the big picture, um, but instead I'll leave that as an assignment for home. Now, one of the, the very basic rules of composition in photography in terms of how to position everything in your frame is something called the rule of thirds. Um, I'm going to say this right now. Stop centering everything in the middle of your frame, please. That means somebody's big goofy face right in the middle of the frame that's overexposed is not going to be very interesting of a photograph. But that same person that's slightly overexposed and moved off center, all of a sudden it's a lot more interesting. Now that's an extreme example and probably a little bit of a white lie, but what, but just moving things off center and dividing it into thirds, dividing the frame into thirds like this, um, is really going to help the composition in your photography. And so in this case you could argue, well, the raft is centered. Well, yeah, but I mean, I didn't really have a choice where the frame, it takes up the entire frame. But you'll notice that interesting things are happening along these lines. And whether or not this was intentional or, um, or an accident, frankly, I don't even remember. This was two years ago now. Um, but this is part of what makes an interesting, what can help you make a photograph interesting. Obviously, it's, it takes more than just composition rules. Um, but try moving things slightly off center, moving it to a third of the frame uh, or, or anything like that, and, and you will be able to improve your, your photography. And in fact, if you take a look at this photo, what do you notice? All of a sudden, you, and you'll notice that this, this finger is it's approximately centered, but it's also off-centered, enough that it's really sort of divided this photo into, into thirds, really, when you take the entire thing into account. Um, so a photo should, you know, you, you, you don't always, of course, rules are meant to be broken. You don't always have to follow this. But if you're unfamiliar with this compositional rule, try it. Just use it a lot and try it and see if it, if it works for you, see if you can get more interesting photos. Um, but also be sure that uh, you can try to achieve some sort of balance uh, in your photos, whether it's um, compositional balance um, or even color balance. It, it really doesn't matter. Uh, don't go with gimmicks too frequently. Like, Don't always be off-centering things. Don't always be uh, putting too much of one color in the photo because eventually that gets a little tiring, frankly. And so you, you, if you vary your photos and have some balance in some of them, uh, that will certainly help quite a bit. And, um, and certainly when we're talking about um, the artistic side of photography, uh, a lot of people love to talk about drawing the eye in particular directions. So the first time that you look at a photo, your eye may land somewhere on it, um, but the photo may draw your eye into a particular direction. So this one isn't the best example, but um, you may think of, for example, a photo of a, of a tree looking up from the stump of a tree or from the very base of the tree, for example. That sort of photo is drawing your eye up the tree and towards the top there. So that's just one example of drawing the eye. And so, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many of these rules and, um, and all of these other things, but, but frankly, I think that um, as long as you, uh, as long as, as you try different things, experiment with different things, and, and begin to develop your own style, which could frankly take years or, uh, or maybe you know, a shorter amount of time, then that's when you will really start to get into the flow of photography and really start to uh, get a knack for it. Now, the economy being what it is, and luckily it's not as bad as it was a while ago, um, I'm 
a little surprised, though not really, that all of you are here because digital photography is really expensive as a hobby. And if you are in this class because you love digital photography, you want to learn a little bit more about it, well, part of what we are going to be doing, and, and perhaps more in passing than anything else, is to try to make this more accessible to you. So I mentioned before that one of the things that you, that you shouldn't do is to purchase a digital, uh, a digital camera body that's new. And that's especially true if you're going to buy an SLR. I recommend buying a used camera body that is maybe one or two notches above what you would have bought new. So for example, if you are looking at um, the Canon line of digital cameras, you might have noticed the Digital Rebel, which is sort of the, the basic entry-level digital camera into Canon's SLR line. Those are great cameras. They're very good. But I recommend going a few years back, looking on Craigslist or eBay. Of course, you know, be careful whenever you, you perform transactions on any of these places, um, uh, or even, I don't know, classified as, wherever you can find this stuff. Um, and look for a few years old cameras. So on the Canon side, because I know the Canon side best, uh, I would recommend the 20D, the 30D, or the 40D. The 50D is too new. You're not going to find a good deal on that, but pretty much any one of those is probably a really good camera to start out with when you're talking about uh, digital photography. And on the, Can and on the Nikon side, um, the equivalent of those. So those are the, the 20D through 40D are sort of the mid-range, uh, mid to low range now. They're, Canon is sort of positioning them at, at the, lower range, the lower range of, of their line. But still, they have the best bang for your buck in terms of the image quality, the features, and, and it's basically enough camera for you to grow into. Whereas the Rebel line is definitely a lot more uh, basic. And it's not, of course, to say that the, the Rebel is, is inferior of a camera, but it has several features that you may, uh, throughout the semester, find uh, are limiting you in some way. And so that you may, you may grow out of it more quickly than you would one of these mid-range cameras. So, uh, my advice is to spend most of your money on lenses because these lenses are pricey, let me tell you. They are very expensive and you will want to, um, you don't want to buy a super nice camera and put a really crappy lens on front of it. You're going to be doing yourself and your camera a disservice. But in terms of lenses, what did I do with that one? I think uh, pretty much required, not for this class, but just in a photographer's toolkit, is this lens here. Both Nikon and Canon have versions of it. It's called a 50 millimeter f1.8. And people love to call it the Nifty 50 because it's one of the cheapest lenses, if not the cheapest. It's fast, which means that it works well in low light. It's very light. It's not heavy at all. It works well when you, when you walk around with it. It's just overall a very solid performing lens on both the Canon and the Nikon side. I, do, I will recommend that you get the latest version. Um, the latest version is not that new. It's still several years old. In the Canon side, it's marked with a, a 2. They love to, to, to denote their um, new versions with Roman numerals. In this case, the modern version is the 2. And that version is updated. It has, uh, I don't know, better optics or something silly like that. But it's, it's worth the $80 to buy that lens and start out with that lens. And generally, lenses that you get with the cameras, so generally, um, you get, along with a camera body, uh, you get what's called a kit lens, which is just a lens that the manufacturer has deemed worthy or whatever of being associated with this camera. Most of the time, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, they're junk. Now, it's, that's especially true on the Canon side. Uh, when I bought the 20D, it came with a kit lens, and I tried it, and it was probably the worst lens I'd ever seen. It's, it was really bad. So I sold it right away to some sucker on eBay who bought it, you know, I don't know, $60 or something. It was great. I'm like, yes, pocket some money. Um, but the point is that the difference, it, it, it may sound crazy that why would they, they package that? And the reason is that it's, it's cheap. And people love to b look at the specifications of the camera and say, oh, look at how many megapixels it has, or oh, look how fast this is. They don't necessarily look at the specs of the lens. And what you're putting in front of the camera is arguably more important than the camera itself, because that is what is focusing the light, and it is the light that makes your photo. So you need to have, uh, though you don't need to buy very expensive lenses, uh, you do need to have um, at least 
well, you don't even have to, but you should have reasonable quality lenses in front of it. And now, whether this means that you sell the, the kit lens that comes with it, and I do think the, the, the kit lens that comes with the Nikon is considerably better than the one that comes from Canon. Um, so uh, for those of you that, that purchase Nikon cameras, you might consider a little harder actually keeping the kit lens. Uh, I mean, there's a variety of factors that are involved. So this, um, this 50 millimeter lens, this is what's called a prime lens. It doesn't zoom. And that may sound like a big deal, but what you get in exchange is how light it is, how cheap it is, and also how bright it is. You can use this in very, very dark areas, and you'll be amazed at the photos you get, especially compared to the kit lens, where the, the camera, it just is not transmitting as much light. In fact, it's transmitting, uh, let's see, one, two, three, it's probably about uh, eight times less light, or maybe even less, compared to this lens, at the same focal length, at, at 50 millimeters. And so um, when I'm talking about these lenses being terrible, that's one of the things, but the other, the other thing is just the optical quality, how good the color is when, it's being, when the light is being transmitted to the camera, uh, how geometrically correct the scene is when it's being transmitted. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at all of these things in more detail, especially in the optics lecture, um, but prime lenses in general will do a better job uh, at all of these things than zoom lenses will. You usually have to spend more money on a zoom lens to get the same quality that you can out of a prime lens. Of course, there's, um, there are exceptions, but uh, uh, in general, that's true. So in general, I would recommend, just to recap, that you purchase used camera bodies and that you focus most of your money on some of the accessories. So the lenses, uh, of course, you're going to need some memory cards. Make sure you have enough memory cards to actually store all of the photos that you take. Uh, and uh, good camera cases. So I mentioned this one here. I, I have another one uh, that I like, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute just to give you an idea of what uh, is, I think is reasonable for a, um, a camera case. Yes, is there a question? Uh, is there any downside to the stabilization and also stabilization in the camera versus the lens? Is there a downside to image stabilization in the camera versus in the lens? Um, there's pros and cons to each. So if the image stabilization, and of course we'll be talking about this in more detail in the optics lecture, the image stabilization is in the lens, then you only get image stabilization for that one lens. However, generally, uh, that also means that the image stabilization can be tuned to that lens, the optics in that lens, so it could perform a little bit better. So on the one hand, um, if you get a system such as the Canon or Nikon system, where the image stabilization is all in the lens and not in the camera body, you then have to pay for lenses where each one has image, image stabilization if you want that. On the other hand, uh, we can make the argument that the image stabilization works a lot better on the whole than in the system that only has it in the body. So um, just like everything else, there's pros and cons. Um, I, I mean, I can't even say that I would recommend one over the other. I think that uh, other factors are more important when deciding on a camera system, such as price and availability of, of lenses and a variety of other factors um, before using that as a, as a way to consider. For example, I, I think, is it the Sony? Well, there's maybe the Pentax. I forget which. There's some manufacturer that use, puts image stabilization in the body, which means it's available for all the lenses rather than in, in the lens itself. Is there another question? No, it's Sony. Oh, it is Sony? Oh, okay. All right. So Sony then. So yeah, and, and Sony, like I mentioned earlier, they do have, uh, they've frankly astounded the world with how cheap some of their full frame digital cameras are. And that's all well and good, except you'll probably in the end pay more for lenses that you would uh, buy on the Canon or Nikon side. Um, so to go back to some of these accessories that I mentioned before, of course, you'll need a good case. Uh, you probably want to protect your uh, investment. And, and even though I mentioned before that you don't have to worry too much about it, it's a better idea, or it is, it's, it's a good idea to not have to worry about it when it's stowed in, in either a, a case of some kind or, or what have you. Um, and so I think hard cases are wonderful, but they are, you know, they're pretty limiting because they are hard cases. Uh, other types of cases that I like are from, this, from Crumpler. So this one looks pretty big, but this can store a whole bunch of junk. I can tell you this, pretty much everything that you see here except the tripods fit into this case. And uh, it's really nice because I can then uh, carry around a lot of equipment with me. And it doesn't really look like a camera bag, even though on the inside it is definitely designed 
uh, for photographers. And um, I think this is in contrast to, for example, Lowepro, uh, which is one of the more popular camera bags, but it looks like a camera bag. And this screams steal me, whereas this, this looks like, oh, okay, he's a, a hipster with a messenger bag. I'm not going to steal the lack of money that he obviously doesn't have. So, um, but, but the other thing is that crumpler is very popular with photographers. So if you see somebody else with the a crumpler bag and you yourself are wearing one, you, you usually get a little nod like that, like, yeah, I know. We're, we're in the club, you know, fist pump and everything. So um, I, I do, I mean, this is a, a recent purchase for me, but I, I, do, I do think that this is a, a nice bag if you're looking for, for camera bags, especially compared to some of the other ones that exist. Uh, of course, getting a tripod, one of the best ways before you, before you buy anything else uh, for your camera, one of the first things you should buy is a good tripod. A good tripod will make a huge difference, bigger than just about anything else for the price uh, of admission to it. And uh, you, can, you can buy a relatively, so nothing, with the caveat that nothing in photography is cheap, you can buy a relatively inexpensive tripod uh, for about you know, $100 or so. It's, it's good, it's solid, and it has some heft to it, and in fact, um, I always, every semester, I always love saying that um, I keep this by my bed because it's, it weighs enough that I would use it as a blunt object if I needed to. Um, but the thing with tripods, just like with everything else, is that uh, it's give and take. So this is a wonderful tripod. It's relatively inexpensive. It supports a lot of weight, um, but it's heavy. And so then you have to choose between spending a lot of money, getting a lot of stability, or you know, having a, a very heavy tripod. And I think usually people say you can pick two of the three. So you can either have stability and cost, like this is, or you can have weight and stability, like this is, or a variety of other things. Now this tripod, I'm not even going to embarrass myself and tell you how expensive it is, but it is significantly lighter. It is half the weight of that. It's made of carbon fiber and some other things. So it's, it actually is better performing than that, but at half, um, at half the weight and it folds. It actually, the reason that I got it is that it, I can travel with it. And that makes a big difference to me. Um, last fall, on a whim, I decided to go to London for Thanksgiving. I didn't want to bake a turkey. I was sick of it. So 24 hours before, I bought the tickets, uh, you know, desperately searched for my passport, and then uh, realized that I couldn't fit my tripod into my case. And I said, okay, well, you know what? I don't care, I'll just bring my camera stuff anyway and I'll see how it goes. And um, if any of you have been to England at the end of November, you probably know what I'm going to say next, and that it was miserable. It was rainy, it was cloudy, no sunny days, and not one photo that I took did I like. And I was so upset with myself that I, you know, I got this great deal over there, but I just couldn't take any photos that I wanted to. And so, that starts the seed of, of, you know, this is how it always works. When you get into photography, you're like, oh, if I had that one thing, I could have taken all these photos. <laughs> and so that's, that's when things start to get really expensive for you. And so let me warn you right now, there's two ways to combat that. You either don't take photos or you don't earn an income. Then you won't have to worry about it at all. But anyway, uh, so it is something that, that you have to watch out for uh, to not, um, you know, go overboard unless it's something that, you know, means... That you, uh, you, could all, you could always justify something that you must have, um, but so it's hard for me to figure out how to say that exactly. But um, you know, be reasonable with, with these expenditures, but having this tripod, something like this to begin with, where even though it's a little bit heavier and you still can carry it around, and it really does mean the difference between getting the photo and not getting the photo, especially when we're talking about tripods. Um, and um, in general, I would recommend to stay away from the types of tripods you would find in like Best Buy or something like that. Um, go to a more reputable camera shop like Calumet, for example, which is near the Cambridge Side Galleria on Bent Street and First or Second, something, something around that. Uh, and they have a bunch of tripods on display. You can bring your camera, put it on there, and you will instantly feel the difference of how stable it is, how well controlled it is, and a variety of other things. And so, though you don't have to break the bank, uh, to buy some fancy carbon fiber tripod, do get a quality tripod. And, and of course, again, I, I want to make clear that it's not required for this class, but you will be much happier with the results of your photos if you spend a little bit of money and get something that's quality versus, um, 
you know, literally a $10 or $20 tripod uh, that comes from Best Buy. And I will warn you that if you do decide to get something from Best Buy and you put uh, a camera, uh, an SLR camera on it, and if the lens has any heft at it, to it at all, so anything other than the, the 50 millimeter basically, um, it's going to, usually you have like a little lever here that you screw and tighten to make it, you know, make it stay put. Eventually that's going to strip and it won't support the, the photo at all. And it will, it will be as if you don't even have a tripod. So um, usually as with most things, um, you know, you pay what you get for, but in the photographic world, you can easily overpay and, and pay for something that you don't really need. Um, so with all of that said, this is an expensive hobby, yes, but there are quite a few things you can actually do yourself. So um, uh, tripods, you can, uh, you can try to mimic that if you have a stable surface like a table, for example. Not that sturdy, but you can still put a camera on there and uh, use the timer function or something like that to try to get a more stabilized image. If you have a railing available to you or a concrete wall you can lean on, just anything that's available to you, try to use it uh, as a source for stability. But even, let's see, do I happen to have this page up? Um, even uh, other things you can do yourself as well. I have this link and I don't remember what it is, so let's see what this what shows up. Um, but um, oh, one thing that I hope this link is, because then it'll, it'll make me look like I have a really good memory, is that uh, eventually if you do some macro photography, for example, uh, you'll notice that one of the, the difficulties of it, no, all right, that's not what I was looking for. One of the difficulties of macro photography is getting enough light to the subject. When you get really close to it, it becomes too dark. It becomes very hard to get uh, a, a good photo and so usually you need a good flash but you can't just use the flash that's on the camera body because when you're so close to a subject your lens is going to sort of uh, block the light that's emitted from your flash and so they, they have this uh, really fancy flash technology called a flash ring and it's basically a ring that goes that hangs around the front of your lens uh, and it just emits light just right around your lens and it's it's great it's perfect for macro photography but um, you know, camera manufacturers knowing that they can overcharge for this stuff, they do when you really could make that yourself. And there's a variety of, of uh, online tutorials that help you make one of these things yourself. And some of these things, whenever we run across um, something that you can do it yourself that we think is useful, we will in fact put it on the course website under resources. Um, and in fact, in general, I would recommend taking a look at the resources to uh, not only get an idea of um, some of the resources that are available to you, but also so you can start reading up on, on specific things that interest you um, or, um, I don't know, just to continue your exploration of digital photography. And so with that said, I think I have exhausted myself with all of this excitement. I thank you all for coming. I hope to see you again in two weeks. Don't forget, next week uh, is a holiday. And uh, oh, and don't forget, please, to pass, finish these and pass them to the side. Give them to us, please, 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 before you leave, so we know what sections uh, we can make. Uh, and we will announce those at the next lecture. Thank you again for coming. We will see you in two weeks. <laughs>